My interest in pacifism began in the years 1966-1967 as I was approaching my 18th birthday in April of 1967 when I would have to register for the draft and decide what I was going to do in terms of this war in Vietnam which was growing more violent by the month and which I was opposing more and more. Two years earlier, in 1964-65, while I'd been in France at a boarding school, and Lyndon Johnson had started bombing North Vietnam in a serious way, my first reaction then had been complete patriotic support for this attack by the U.S. Air Force and by Johnson. I had had arguments with my French roommates at this boarding school I was attending that year. In the dark, we would call back and forth from our little beds to each other about this war we Americans were starting in Vietnam and how foolish it was, how violent and unfair it was, according to my two roommates, Saint-Saint and Mark Klein. They were educated in terms of colonial wars, imperialist wars in Vietnam. No one knew better than the French the folly of such a war. They had lost in 1954, only 10 years earlier. They had ignominiously been defeated at Dien Bien Phu and gone home, white men whipped by non-white soldiers firing from the jungle, a terrible disaster, awful for racists everywhere. My views may have started to shift even then when I heard these things from my French roommates. I resisted because I was an American abroad, and so I had this automatic reflex to defend my country when I was overseas. But there were voices within me that wondered. Some small skeptic inside me had always wondered about pacifism and the church, the Christian church, in my case, the Presbyterian church in Ithaca, New York, where I'd grown up. The sermons were always about how we should not kill. Jesus had told us we must be kind to each other, treat each other as if we were our own brothers and so on, except in war. If a war came along, then it was okay to pick up a gun and go slaughter your brother. I couldn't fool myself into thinking that the enemy was not my brother. That had always baffled me, that hypocrisy. And there was another important cultural hypocrisy that had bothered me, which came through a force that was, in my life, at least as strong as any church, Hollywood. There were a number of movies that came out in the 1950s. They all seemed to have Gary Cooper in them for some reason, and they all involved Quakers. There was friendly persuasion, in the time of the Civil War, a family of Quakers who are torn as to whether to help defend their neighbors and their country by going and killing these Confederates, or whether to stay true to their pacifism. The young son buckles, he goes off to fight, and that's a great victory for the American way of looking at manhood. Then there was High Noon, in which Gary Cooper plays the anti pacifist. He's the sheriff in the small town. These terrible killers are approaching. His wife, Grace Kelly, is the Quaker in this case. She wants him to be a pacifist and to leave town with her and not kill anyone. Well, he kills them, and she kills also in the end to save his life. And that's another great triumph for our ethos of, when in doubt, kill the opponent. This is our way of dealing with things. And Christianity is a troubling voice in the background. Jesus is pushed to the side when it comes to these things. St. Augustine and his just war doctrine, I never got that either, that loophole. It seemed that the Christian church could not avoid hypocrisy in these things. And I had no trouble 
in deciding to be a conscientious objector in my opposition to the war in Vietnam, to be a pacifist. It all made fine sense to me. My two brothers, who were older, they were 10 and 12 years older, they'd both been in the army. But that was in peacetime. It was an entirely different dynamic in those days than what I faced in 1967. And so I registered as a conscientious objector, even though if I'd been seriously pressed to give the most honest answer, I would have had to say, no, I did not believe in God, but I did believe in pacifism and in the central message of Jesus. But no one pressed me to say that. There were ways of making a general protestation of your belief in the Hebraic Christian point of view, the heritage, and so on, without bringing this troubling issue of God directly into it. And I did that in my letter to the draft board to make my position when I was turning 18 years old. Twelve years later, in 1978-79, I found myself in Costa Rica, and I happened onto a village of Quakers up in the mountains in northwestern Costa Rica. These were expatriate North American Quakers from conservative communities in Alabama and Iowa. They were farmers, these young men and women, who had become terribly distressed at the militarism and materialism at the heart of life in North America. Most of this party who had gone down to settle in Costa Rica had been men of about 20 and their young wives. I think there were one or two older couples, but mostly they were young people, and the men had already served time in the prisons in America. They knew how the American system worked. They wanted to live in a place that had no army whatsoever, and the only place in the Western Hemisphere, the only country in the Western Hemisphere without an army was Costa Rica. So they went there, went up into the mountains, and started a dairy community there called Monte Verde. They had dairy cattle. They made cheese. Mostly cheese was the product because it was small enough they could put it in a truck and drive it to San Jose, the large city of Costa Rica, and sell it there. By that means, they supported themselves over the years. It was about 30 years later. Those 20-year-old settlers were now about 50 years old. They had built homes there in this beautiful paradise up high where you could look out and see the Pacific Ocean far in the distance, the Gulf of Nicoya, and behind you, if you were looking west toward the ocean, Behind you was the Continental Divide with mist just lapping over, and on particular nights when the moon was full and bright, and the mist was just optimum for this effect, the mist blowing over the ridge, you could see not one, but two rainbows sometimes, one over the other, moon bows. You could actually see just a hint of the spectrum of colors in these moon bows at night. It was a magical place, Monteverde, in 1979. I was so lucky to happen onto it, so lucky to be taken in by the Gwyndon family, which was the central family of the community. They had many children. They took me and this other bachelor in, we would go there on Sunday nights and have dinner and sing songs and eat popcorn and be part of a family. It was wonderful. And so I saw real Quakers up close in their family environment. I saw the children calling their mother the, calling their father the, having silent blessings before meals, nothing pretentious, just a moment of silence before the meal. And I went to silent meeting in the schoolhouse every Sunday. I loved the atmosphere of sharing, the meditative community feeling, sitting there in silence with your neighbors, 
feeling part of a community, feeling a spirit of good-hearted people around you, trying hard to think of things that transcended normal daily worries. I learned some real facts about Quaker life, and I felt as if I was transported back in time somehow in this pioneer community to an America in the time when my own ancestors had been in Conestoga wagons, making their way out to Iowa and settling there. I had heard rumors about Grandmother Mosier's family having been Quaker and maybe Granddad Mosier's family, but I didn't bother to find out until I'd spent this year in Costa Rica. I came back to the States and started looking through these books Grandad Mosher had put together, quick outlines of each person, each family, that had preceded us going clear back to the Mayflower. And he prided himself that among these ancestors were two men who had indeed sailed across on the Mayflower in 1620. Richard Warren and Francis Cook were those two men's names. So we were lifetime members of the DAR if we were female in our family, if we wanted to be. We went way back. Also, this pacifist strain of our family went way back. He didn't talk a great deal about being a pacifist himself. In fact, he never claimed to be a pacifist. But he did have one reference I was glad to come across. He said that when he had been a child, his father, Lemuel Obadiah Mosher, had taught the family to observe a silent blessing before each meal. They would cross their arms, bow their heads, and have a moment of silence. I was happy to come across that because I had just experienced that with the Gwyndon family in Costa Rica, and it meant something to me now. The other thing that Grandad had been very proud of in his background, there were the people on the Mayflower, but the two people he was most proud of were his own grandparents, Stephen and Ruth Smith Mosier, who had been farmers near Mount Gilead, Ohio, and had, in the 1850s, run a station of the Underground Railway. His own father, Grandad's father, Lemuel, had told him about when he, Lem, had been a young boy and he had seen in his house his mother carrying platters of food up to the attic at night and coming back the next morning with the platters empty. She wouldn't explain what had happened and no one asked. They seemed to have a tacit understanding that this was beyond discussion. But it turned out years later, they found out that she had been feeding these escaped slaves. And then during the night, her husband and other people would shepherd them to the next station on their way north to Canada. Granddad was very proud of that couple. And they were Quakers. But he was a strayed Quaker, it seemed. I thought maybe Grandmother Mosher also had Quakers in her family, but I wasn't quite sure about that. And then one very dismaying conversation I had with my father was in 1981 in New York City. I was living in New York City for a while. My parents had come down to visit me. We were about to go to Camelot at Lincoln Center. We were at a restaurant with my cousin and his wife and some other people. Dad and I were down at one end of the table, and we got off into our own conversation. It had to do with Granddad, who was, at that point, 99 years old, born in 1882. Dad said to me, you know, it's funny, but one of his major regrets in his life, my father, is that he never got to serve in the military. I was stunned to hear this, but I thought he was a Quaker, I said. 
Dad smiled and said, Well, some Quakers are better than others. Which brings us to the subject of Richard Nixon. He had served in World War II. He'd been in the Navy, and mostly what he'd done is play poker and had made a considerable amount of money on ships. But he had been in the Navy, which surprised me a little bit because I'd heard that his background was Quaker. His mother, in particular, I'd heard, was a fairly serious Quaker. But he'd lapsed and stayed true to pacifism. He had wanted to go into politics probably from the beginning and knew that this was not a good thing to be a pacifist and to go into politics. Much better to be a war hero like John F. Kennedy or at least to have served so you could call yourself a hero, whether you had been or not. You were entitled to run for office. A favorite photograph of mine of my father's family was taken in Grinnell, Iowa, where my grandparents lived. Martin Luther Mosier, his wife Elva, they lived out there sunset years in Grinnell, Iowa, in the Mayflower home, funny enough. In this photo, Martin and Elva are sitting, and their children, their five children, are around them. If you look closely in the background, on the wall of ML's apartment and Elva's apartment was a small array of photos of Dick and Pat Nixon and their two daughters. Photos apparently clipped out of magazines, a little shrine to the Nixon family, strays from pacifism. My grandparents were rock-ribbed Republicans, and they stayed by their party. They stayed by their man, Richard Nixon. This get-together had to have been well before the Watergate disaster dethroned their hero. My father's comment about how some Quakers were better Quakers than others also took me back to another photo I'd come across in Granddad's brown book. A photo of himself this time. No one else was in the photo. He must have been in his late 80s by the time this one was taken. And he was wearing a uniform of a cadet of some sort of military training outfit, a kind of quasi-ROTC uniform. He had had that degree of military training, but that hadn't satisfied him, evidently. He was priding himself that he could, even as an old man, still fit fine into this uniform he'd had as a 20-year-old. That photo, too, had rather baffled me when I'd first come across it. It flew in the face of my belief in his Quaker background. But it was possible to have both, of course, and I didn't accept that for many years. Eventually, Granddad died. He lived to be 99.9 years old. More years went by, and my own father died, and eventually my mother. I was down in North Carolina, going through the detritus of their lives, boxes and boxes of old Christmas cards and Christmas letters they'd been sent over the decades, money-raising flyers from all these good causes, the United Negro College Fund, and one thing after another to which they had donated money. I stuck all these things into other boxes that weren't so moldy, drove them back here, and here they sat. Finally, when they were starting to smell a little moldy yet again, I did shovel the stuff out of them and go through it. Most of it I threw out because it was of no value to anyone. But I came across a few astonishing things. And the most astonishing to me, and the most touching, was a carbon copy of a letter my father had written to my draft board a few weeks after I had turned 18 and had sent in my own supplication to the draft board, hoping to be adjudged 
a good pacifist and a conscientious objector, even though I was not officially a Quaker. In a few lines, my father did a pretty good job of setting me up with a family background, which was all true, that indicated that I did have pacifism in my background. Selective Service Board number 62, Ithaca, New York, May 22, 1967. Gentlemen, I am convinced that our son, Richard Mosher, is deeply sincere in his conviction that he cannot conscientiously participate in military service, and that this conviction grows directly out of his understanding of God and man. He has grown up in a family where these issues, like other issues of human conduct and social responsibility, were frequently discussed. Richard was born in India while I was serving there as a missionary of the Presbyterian Church. I myself registered as a conscientious objector during World War II. Well, I had never heard of this, that Dad had been a conscientious objector during the war. He hadn't talked about it. He had simply done it at the time because it was important to him and he'd kept it to himself. My mother was reared as a Quaker, he says here. Well, that was another thing I had never been sure of. I'd known Granddad had Stephen and Ruth Smith Mosher, the Quakers who had run the station of the Underground Railway, but I hadn't known that Elva, Grandmother Mosher, had been raised a Quaker. Richard's mother has been conscientiously opposed to all military service and action for many years. Again, that wasn't anything I knew for sure. I knew that Mom had opinions about the Army and about military action, but I'd never heard her express such a clear point of view as this. Having discussed thoroughly with Richard the issues that are involved and having probed the sincerity of his beliefs, I am convinced that his convictions about military service are deep and firm, influenced by his religious heritage and confirmed through his own reason and judgment. Sincerely, Arthur T. Mosher. Well, that was a wonderful thing to come across. A letter from my father, years after he had gone. Not written to me, but indeed written to me. Never in the expectation that I would come across it at some late date. It could just as easily have happened that these bales of correspondence would have all been tossed in the trash. In many families, I'm sure this happens. But it was worth all the pawing through, the squinting at hard-to-read handwriting to come across this affirmation from my own father of my beliefs, which at the time I had turned 18 had been strong, and yet I hadn't had a clear idea of who I was as a young man. At that point, how could I? Two years earlier, I'd been all for our bombing campaign in North Vietnam, and now I was all against it. Youth swings hard to one side and then to the other. I thought I was a pacifist. But by the time I read this letter from my father, years and years later, I knew I was. It all made sense. And it was so wonderful to come across this evidence that he had been himself and that he had believed in my belief. That was wonderful. In his letter to the draft board, his comment that my mother had always opposed military service took me back to something that happened just three days after my 18th birthday. My birthday was 24th of April that year, and on the 27th, Martin Luther King Jr. came to St. Paul and spoke. 
It was a school day in the late morning, but Mom wrote me out an excuse from school, and she and I drove to the Ag School campus in St. Paul, and we heard him speak. It was outdoors in the main quadrangle of the Ag School. I remember there was a platform built there, and I remember that Dr. King was very tired as he spoke. By the spring of 1967, he was getting a lot of flack for his opposition to the Vietnam War, his very strong opposition. Many people were telling him, look, you're a civil rights activist. You're the best at this that we have. You must stick to your civil rights work or this will water it down if you confuse things by coming out against the war. And he said, I can't do that. This is all about conscience. The civil rights struggle is about morality and conscience, and so is opposition to the Vietnam War. They can't be separated. But this had worn him down, this criticism. You could tell. He was only 38 years old. He had just under a year to live. And he was worn out, but he spoke with his usual eloquence. Funny enough, it was only about six weeks later that Dad went off to Washington to a meeting with LBJ himself, President Johnson, at the White House in the cabinet room with about eight other men. They were all men who were experts in world hunger and agricultural development. They sat around this long table that's familiar to many people from photos of presidents in the cabinet room. My father seems to be giving Johnson a kind of bemused look across the table. Johnson clearly is being very forceful and has maybe delivered one of his earthy witticisms. Dad wouldn't have spoken out against the war at that meeting. He wasn't there as an expert on war. He was there for being one of the world's leading experts on agricultural development. If it had been me sitting around that table, I most likely would have come out with my opposition to the war and gotten Johnson all irritated. But my father didn't say anything about that. He knew when to speak out and when not to. And partly as a result of knowing when not to speak out, he reached a level of much more influence in the world than I ever have. I think the most touching entry in Grandad's entire Brown book is a story he tells about when he was not a boy anymore, but a man. He had become the first county agricultural agent in Illinois and the first county agent in Iowa. And this is a story that took place during those years. First, he had told a story about an orphan boy he had liked. He was a fine, quiet lad who had come from a soldier's orphan's home in Davenport. We all liked him. This was in his classroom, Grandad's class. After the teacher had told the rest of us what she thought we were fitted for doing in our lives, this boy rather hesitatingly asked, What can I do? The answer was short and brutal. Oh, I haven't the least idea what you can do. The poor boy almost cried as he left the group and went back to his seat. I never forgave that teacher. I wonder what did become of that orphan boy. The world needs people with his personality. That shows something about Granddad's empathy. And then following is another episode. Twenty years after the above incident took place, our nation was engaged in World War I. As county agricultural agent in Woodford County, Illinois, it was my duty to inform farm boys of their responsibilities and rights regarding the selective service. Woodford County had large groups of Mennonites who were conscientious objectors. Nearly 100 boys, many with their parents, came to me for information about the draft. One orphan boy who was not a conscientious objector and had a very pleasing personality, similar to that of that other orphan at Lynn Grove, came to talk with me about his problem. 
I had known him quite well in Sunday school. His question was, should I enlist or wait for the draft? Of course, I avoided telling him what I thought he should do. I told him that it was up to him and him only. Finally, he asked me what I would do if I were in his place. That was not easy for me to say. After thinking it over a moment, I said I thought that I would enlist if I were his age and as footloose as he was. He did enlist and was killed in action in France. That was about 60 years ago. I continued to wonder if I was guilty of contributing to the death of that fine lad. That's my grandfather, Mosier, the Quaker who wasn't. <laughs>